Well, welcome to the OTB channel, uh, an episode two of uh, one of my rambles. Um, last week, it seemed to go down quite well with a few of you, so I thought I might make it a regular feature. I've changed the name from OTB's Sunday Ramble to OTB's Linux Ramble because I can't always guarantee it's going to be on a Sunday. And uh, so I thought it was more of a generic name. But this is episode two, as I said, and uh, we'll have a little bit of a natter in a completely unstructured way. I don't start with a fixed in stone plan for these. I've got a few little pointers that I've written on uh, a piece of paper, um, bullet points if you like, and uh, what I intend to do is just meander around and uh, chat about the thoughts that have been going through my head over the last week, um, which are not necessarily going to be presented in any particular order, but uh, it's a bit of entertainment, this. It, it, it's not for educational purposes. I'm not showcasing anything. Um, I'm just using this as a, a forum, really, to air my thoughts. And hopefully you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, I'll stop doing it. But the first one last week, um, people seem to like it. So here we go. Um, let's uh, kick off and... Uh, Move to my screen, Endeavor OS, which I'm using today, and uh, we'll uh, kind of start this whole thing off. You should now see in front of you uh, a terminal, a plain terminal, Steve at Steve PC. Steve being uh, OTP's real name. Uh, I'm on my Endeavor OS um, distribution, which is still running absolutely fine, like a dream. And I just wanted to, to cover um, off uh, a couple of things that occurred to me during the week. In last week's ramble, I was looking at the TLDR alternative to the man pages which I believe stands for Too Long, Don't Read. Great name. And uh, someone replied to the ramble, which, which I have to say people seem to enjoy, uh, with a comment about uh, D-Message, that uh, they'd never actually heard of it before, but when I used it, uh, they had to go themselves because they had a bit of a problem with a, a ThinkPad laptop, and they managed using the D-Message uh, command to debug the issue. And what struck me is actually many of the Linux commands that those who've been using our, our systems for many years uh, sort of take for granted is the fact that Linux has changed significantly uh, over the last decade or two. And for the most part, it just works. There isn't actually a need to get down and dirty with the command line uh, anywhere near as much as uh, we had to do 15 years ago. And so a command like D message, which uh, I learned when I was trying to troubleshoot various systems, um, may not be known. So let me give you a scenario. Uh, this was probably me 15 years ago. I'd go onto a forum and I'd post a question like, I've just installed Linux and my wireless isn't working. Help. Right. Now, there's no information there. And many of us, if we saw that comment now, <laughs> we've got more questions than we have answers. You know, what, <laughs> what Linux distribution have you uh, installed? What kind of wireless card have you got? Is it USB or is it an internal PCI card? Um, has the module for your card loaded? In fact, what chipset is, is the wireless card uh, manufactured with? Um, whole range of questions. The problem is if you've come from Windows, you don't necessarily know because you stick a wireless card in your machine or a USB wireless dongle, you load up some drivers, 
and it just works. The problem is, you go to a shop now and you buy a wireless dongle and it could be any generic make. It could even be some no-name model off eBay that's cost you a couple of quid. Well, knowing what's printed on the plastic or telling me it's a Belkin wireless card isn't going to help us debug your systems. And the way this conversation would go when I posed a question like... Uh, <laughs> I've just installed Linux and my wireless it wasn't working was would be right well first of all what distribution are you running secondly what's the chipset of your card and the first thing I'd say is well it's a Belkin the model number is such and such and whoever was on the forum would come back and say yes but what's the chipset and I'd go back and say I'm sorry I don't know how to find that information and I'd be given a command to put in and post on the forum. We'd get that far, I'd post the information on the forum, and they'd say to me, other questions. Okay, that uses such and such a module. For instance, the RT2500 module. Is that loaded? Uh, I'm not sure. So I'd get another command that uh, I'd run in the terminal and post uh, the answers back on the forum. And then they'd say to me, have you tried pinging an IP address? A what? <laughs> so someone had taught me through that and I'd try pinging an IP address and they'd ask me, okay, and is the interface up and running? And uh, have you checked your DNS? Uh, and it all went a little bit peak tongue and ultimately I learned how to do all of this excuse me while I log in again uh, ultimately I learned how to do all of this simply because I asked so many questions and I was asked to post back the output of particular commands which I suppose now have become hardwired and I don't think about them. I'm not a command line guru, but I do know a few commands and there are a few that I post all the time. And I thought it might be quite useful to just look at those uh, before we move on. So I suppose you could see this as a, a way to minimize your uh, potential RTFM responses. I don't think there's any reason to say RTFM to anybody if you're helping somebody on a forum. But sometimes it can be quite frustrating and I understand why they used to do it. But uh, hopefully people realise that everybody has to start somewhere. So let's start. D-Message. We'll chuck out a whole load of uh, messages uh, which are essentially messages from the kernel when it was um, looking at your hardware during the boot process, and it continues to fill up as you go through. Now, you're going to have a hard time just in the terminal trying to scroll all the way back because it'll only go so far. So you've got a couple of examples or things that you can do here. What I normally do is pipe it through less. And I showed you this last week, which will take you right from the word go, and you can just literally find the bit that you're looking for. The other thing you can do is you can look for something specific. So um, let me think. D message. Grep. SDA. Okay, so the kernel's there probing uh, my SDA drive, which is actually one of the um, the SSDs that I've got in this USB 3 dock. Or you could just grep for mer error messages. And there's none come up, I'm pleased to say. However, what I used to end up doing was just dumping the whole of D-Message to a file. And then I could look through at my leisure. Um, it would even open up in a, a word processor and I could use the uh, find commands in the word processor at the time, which I was more comfortable with. 
Now, if you want to output uh, anything, any output of a command to a file, it's really simple in Linux. You simply use the greater, la greater than um, sign and you name the text file that you want it to output to. So I'm saying there, right, D message, send the output to D message dot text. Okay, all done. And if I do an LS to have a look at uh, what I've got on my, uh, in my home directory, you can see D message dot text is there. And if I do less D message dot text, there you go. The whole thing's now in a text file. One of the things that I should perhaps talk about, I did the D message grep error or the D message less with this pipe symbol. This pipe symbol is incredibly useful. You can with it send the output of one command and input it into another command. So what this actually means, this D message pipe grep error is run D message, send all of the output that is generated by that command over to this and grep the word error. Simple, really. Um, you can do a number of things. Learn to use grep, please, because it's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, you can use the little eye in front of it, which just means uh, make it case insensitive. And as you can see there, there is something it's pulled out of there, but it had a capital E and it wasn't actually pulling that out when I just typed in error. So if you want it, make it case insensitive, put the grep minus I in. So grep, incredibly useful, less, incredibly useful, D message itself, an absolute gold mine of messages if you're having hardware problems. And the pipe command allows you to manipulate the outcome of perhaps particularly long messages. Now, this isn't a, um, a tutorial as such, I mean, because you can find out more detail about all of these things, because most Linux commands have lots of different switches. But along with D message, I also use a command LSPCI, which will look at all the onboard PCI devices that you have on your system. And you can see there what I've got. Um, so it's pointing to a whole range of things. And down here, you'll see Network Controller, Intel Corporation Wireless Revision 78. So that is my network controller at the moment. I'm running wirelessly. If I wanted a little bit more information than that, you can do LSPCI and ask for verbose Oops, it helps if I spell right, LSPCI, and ask for verbose output. And this time you'll get a little bit more information. And there you have that same, what was a one line uh, entry, now expanded. And it's not only telling me that it's an Intel, Intel Corporation wireless uh, card, it's also telling me that it's in use and it's using the IWL WIFI module. So, brilliant, really powerful command, LSPCI. <coughs> Excuse me. Another really useful command is the LSUSB command. Again, these days we use uh, a lot of USB dongles and uh, USB connected hardware rather than standard PCI stuff that's plugged into your motherboard, an LSUSB basically does something very, very similar to LSPCI for your USB connected um, uh, hardware. And as you can see there, well, just looking, you can see the Razer, which is my webcam. You can also see my Blue Yeti uh, microphone and a load of other stuff. Again, I can expand that. I can type 
LS USB, the, and wow, <laughs> it doesn't half expand it with lots more information. Now you may want to actually dump this into a file to look at it properly, but you get the general idea. There's my microphone. Is that my microphone? No, there's the blue microphone. So you get all sorts of stuff there. Uh, the vendor code, the product code, the works. So if you're trying to troubleshoot, this is a good thing to do. Okay. So LSPCI, LSUSB, and DMessage are essential troubleshooting tools. Um, now, the other thing I kept uh, getting asked years ago was, has the kernel loaded the module for your device? So we'll have got to the point where we've identified the chipset, we've identified whether or not uh, there is a, a kernel module currently uh, in use, and to look at your kernel modules, you just type lsmod, and it will tell you all the modules that are actually in use at the time. You can see there, by the way, uh, duh, 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 duh. I think we just passed it. IWL Wi-Fi. Again, you can use uh, less or you can use gref. So um, LS mod, pipe it into grep, IWL, was it Wi-Fi? Yes, there it is. And there you are. You can see a couple of lines with that mentioned. So I always think of these as the three LS commands. LS mod, LS PCI, and LS USB. So many times I would find that, uh, yes, my wireless card had been recognized. Yes, Linux had loaded the correct module, but I still couldn't get online. Why was that? Well, the next command that I always used to have a look at my network interfaces was if config. And you can see there, <coughs> excuse me, I've still got this cough, that that brings up your loopback interface in the middle, um, which is the IP address of your computer, not your computer, but let, let's kind of go over that. <laughs> That's your local host IP address. But you've got ENO1, which is the IP or the details about my uh, wired connection. And you'll see there that it gives me the MAC address of my wired connection, but there isn't actually an internet address associated with that. But if I come down to WLP58S0, that's actually my wireless card. And you can see there that I have an internet address of 192.168.1.230. Now that's obviously an internal internet address. I'm not going to let you know what my external IP address is for obvious reasons. But the interface has come up. It's been given an IP address, which is absolutely great. So it's connected to my router. And if I wanted to find the IP address of my router, well, root N. And I can see that my IP address is under gateway 192.168.1.254. Okay. So it's up and running. It's got an IP address but I can't actually get on the internet. Why might this be? Well, this is when I'd be asked to, can you ping an IP address? And so I would normally ping one of the Google DNS servers, which is 8.8.8.8, .8 simply because it's easy to remember. And there you go. I do have internet connectivity. I have internet connectivity because I'm being told there that 
um, I'm receiving information from 8.8.8.8. .8 so my system is able to send data or a ping out over the internet um, and the connection is active. Why then can I not get online? Well, at this stage, I'd be thinking to myself, well, it's probably a DNS error. DNS is one of those um, really complicated... Uh, it's a complicated part of networking if, if it's not something you're familiar with. However, the easiest way to think about it is DNS is the domain name service and it's like a telephone directory that converts um, a host name such as www.google.com into an IP address so that the internet understands everything. So DNS servers that your computer is going out to when you type something in your browser like google.com, your computer will send that out to a DNS server. The DNS server will come back and say, oh yeah, that's internet uh, IP address, blah, blah, blah. And it's all seamless, happens within seconds. So let me give you a quick example of this. Um, if I wanted to see what my DNS is, we have a file called resolve.conf in the etc directory and i can see there that i've just got a single name server and it's actually the ip address of my router you'll often find this and if you don't have specific um, dns servers set up in your router it will just default to whatever name servers your uh, internet service provider uses. Okay, absolutely fine. It may well be though, that that's not working at the moment, that your internet service providers, DNS servers are not functioning as they should be. Fine, let me just step back a little bit and show you what I mean by this. If I use, here's another little uh, tool that's worth getting to know. It's a command called dig or a utility called dig. And I type in google.com. Dig google.com. We get some output which tells us what the IP address is of the Google server. And it comes in a question and answer section. So the question section I'm looking up Google, google.com and I'm looking up the A record. The answer section comes back. The IP address to that is actually that. So let us now go on to Firefox and in the, the browser address bar, let's just paste that IP address and click go. And there you go. I'm straight onto uh, <laughs> the Google web page because that's how the internet works. It works on the basis of IP addresses, but it has a translation layer in between your computer and the wider internet known as a DNS server. And the DNS server translates your human readable requests to go on to example.com or google.com into an IP address so that your browser can actually go to the correct page. If you're having problems with your DNS, you can ping outside, but you just cannot bring up a web page. The answer ultimately is to put in a different DNS address. Google have their own DNS servers. Uh, I pinged it earlier. The first one is 8.8.8.8, .8 and I think the second one's 8.8. Dot four, dot four. You can also use open DNS and you can put in the DNS server IP addresses. And often that's all it will take to get you back up and running. So that was a little bit of a very, very swift run through. 
D message important, LSPCI important, LSUSB important, LSMOD, if config and dig. Just before we finish this section, I should say that actually if config uh, and root are now deprecated and being overtaken by another set of commands rather than if config that's now being taken over by an ip command which ip space a which gives you a slightly different view um we're in the process of changing over and uh, you'll often find on some of the modern distros that if config and root are no longer on your system by default and you'll you'll have to install the net tools package if you want to use them i'm in the process of trying to learn the new syntax for this ip command which which i must admit is not hardwired so i'm still going back to the old one whenever i can but anyway just a few thoughts so not a tutorial as such but just a few commands and uh, the question about, uh, or rather the comment about D-Message that I got in the uh, last episode just started me thinking. I wonder how many people new to Linux uh, are actually aware of the basics. Uh, if you knew at all, great. <laughs> Sorry to have bored you. Um, what else have I been doing? Yeah, a li little bit of an update, I think. Um, as you know, I use an Intel NUC. It's a little tiny box. It's got a half terabyte uh, NVMe SSD in it. And um, I've got 16 gig of RAM in it. It uses Intel Iris graphics. And every single week I'm stunned at how well it performs. I've got it hooked up to uh, a USB uh, SSD hub. Um, with four standard SSDs in that and they run pretty much near native speed which is how I'm able to use all the different systems so great a few weeks ago though I started experimenting I, I, I was just using 720p output because Intel Iris graphics well they're on board they're not exactly a powerful uh, graphics uh, GPU so I was keeping things um, to a level that I thought my hardware could cope with. And up until a few weeks ago, everything was going well. Someone then said they would prefer if I, I uh, broadcast in 1080. So for the last two or three weeks, I've been doing that. And by and large, the NUC has coped quite well. Um, there's been a little bit of screen tearing when I've been using VirtualBox to uh, to look at particular distros where they have effects turned on. But on the whole, it seems to have worked. I am getting the impression, though, that when I do that, I'm really pushing the Intel NUC to the edge of its capability. And uh, certainly recording in 1080 has tripled the rendering time of the videos. So, I've been thinking about whether or not it might be worth looking at something a little bit more powerful. Not quite yet, because I'm not financially in a situation where I can afford it. But we have something going on at home at the moment. Um, I've mentioned a few times uh, I moved into uh, a new house at the end of January. And one of the reasons that we, we bought this property because was because... It had a very posh shed. Shed's probably not the right word, but a very posh outhouse, uh, granny flat almost, um, in the back garden. And it had mains electricity. It had its own bathroom and shower. It also had its own kitchen dining area. And uh, my intention was to eventually move the computers there and uh, to work with that um, unfortunately in May a neighbor decided to have a bonfire and burn some rubbish and unfortunately she burned the shed down 
with the result that uh, I've had to make a claim on my insurance for the best part of 40,000 quid. And it's taken months and months, but we're now perhaps a month to six weeks away from getting the new outhouse building um, rebuilt. And when that's done, I'm probably going to move everything into there because this little room, um, it's getting quite packed. Uh, let me just show you what I've got here. I've got a photograph somewhere. Right, so there's the, uh, oops. There's a, a picture of my desktop as it is at the moment. You can see that I'm using uh, an LCD ring now, uh, trying to get a little bit more light on the situation. But what you can see there of my desktop, that's pretty much <laughs> about all there is of the room. There is very little room to expand. So I'm hoping that when the... Uh, when the cabin's rebuilt, um, I can move everything into there. It doesn't have an internet connection, unfortunately, and um, I've got round that by using uh, power line plugs, these things, and uh, a little Edimax um, wireless repeater. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the reason... Um, the reason I'm talking about this now is it's a perfect excuse, I think, if I move everything down to this cabin when it's built, to perhaps upgrade my hardware. Um, I'll show you what I'm looking at at the moment. Um, let's just have a look. If I go over to uh, simplynook.uk uh, and have a look at the products, build your own nook. And I go all the way down. I think this is the one I was looking at. Yeah, this was the one. The Nook 8i7HVK kit. And it's a beast. I mean, I'm impressed already with the Intel Nook. So I, I want to get another one. Um, it's £666 excluding VAT, so you've got to add on another 130 140 quid for VAT. And then, of course, you've got to fill it full of NVMe um, SSDs and uh, 32 gig of RAM, etc., etc. So it's well over a 1,000 quid. But uh, it really is a beast. And it's actually got, uh, as well as the Intel iris uh, graphics it's got radian rx vega graphics which is brilliant it will support up to six screens uh, in 1080 or four screens at 4k and uh, it's absolutely full of uh, display ports and usb 3.1 ports and ah. Uh, I'm really craving this, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, at the moment, it's not something that uh, I can go for. Nevertheless, that's what I've got in mind, so I thought I'd just show you that. Um, now, I was talking about uh, getting internet working in this cabin. Okay, so the way I've done this, um, luckily, the... The mains electricity in the cabin runs off the mains in the house, even though it's probably about 150 feet away. And uh, I can get no wireless signal down there. So I used a power line plug. There's another one plugged into my router here in the front of the house. And luckily, I could pick up a signal. What I wanted, though, was a wireless signal. And for that, by the way, I dug these out of the fire and I'm amazed that they're, they're not burnt to a crisp, although one on the other side of the cabin did get burnt. This is the uh, Edimax. It just looks like a plug. Um, N300 EW7438. Let me just move to the web page so you can see what I'm looking at. 
and this is absolutely brilliant you can set it up for a whole range of things you can you can set it up as an extender which has been the one thing that i've not used it for but you can also set it up as an access point or as a wi-fi bridge and when i say wi-fi bridge i almost want to call that wireless adapter mode so i had plugged uh, this in to uh, the power line plug and from there i could set it up to uh, actually put out um, a wireless signal and, and set it up with its own wireless network so in other words it, it acted as an access point and it was working pretty well um, I'm certainly going to continue using this. It's only N300, but given that it's about 150 foot down the bottom of the garden, where no wireless signal can reach, uh, the power line plugs seem to do the job. I originally bought this um, a while ago, um, and it wasn't for setting up a, a wireless access point out of reach of my standard wireless signal. Believe it or not, it was for installing Arch on a laptop. As you know, when you're installing Arch, if you're not plugged in via Ethernet, you can have a few issues um, until you're up and running and then you can connect to your wireless with Network Manager. So my solution to this was to simply uh, use this little Edimax uh, uh, dongle thingy in uh, Wi-Fi bridge mode as a, a wireless adapter and I would plug this in and have a wire leading from the Edimax uh, plug straight into the Ethernet port of my laptop. The L Edimax plug would pick up the wireless signal and the laptop would just simply treat it as uh, if it was plugged directly into a router brilliant little piece of kit they're about 20 quid i'd recommend it to anybody anyway so uh <laughs> they're my plans um it all depends of course on whether or not i manage to save up enough money to get the new pieces of kit um which i, I would imagine might take me a year or so rather than thinking about a matter of months and more importantly, it's whether or not uh, she who must be obeyed, my lovely wife, uh, will allow me to uh, use the new cabin in that way, as I'm sure she has her own plans for it as well. In fact, I know she has. Um, and she normally wins, so it may not happen. Um, okay, well, time's moving on, and uh, I've been waffling away or rambling away. I, didn't, I was going to call it the Linux waffle, but I know waffle is uh, something different in America. So the ramble seems to, to fit the name just as well. Um, I was reading through uh, a number of different uh, news articles, and I came across this. Now, I don't know how I missed this, to be honest. Um, it's amazing. So, distrotest.net. You have a whole range of distros here, which you can open up in your browser and run. I'm not quite sure what the technology is, whether, whether it's using VNC or something similar, but um, you can use all the functions of the system uninstall and install software, test install programs, and delete or format hard drives or system files. Wow. And you don't actually have to install anything. So the only thing I found about it, it seems to work pretty well, but there's obviously a limited bandwidth here. Um, they're hosting 753 versions with 234 operating systems. I don't like or wouldn't like to be paying for their bandwidth, but great. Um, so let's just see if it works. Uh, let's pick something. Um, duh, 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 duh. 
Something straightforward. Should we go for... No, we won't go for free BSD. I'm still learning that myself. Uh, let, oh, Nopix. Shall we give Nopix a spin? The only thing I find that when I've tried to launch these before... Okay, so that's the latest version, August 2019. When I've tried to launch these before... I often just have to wait a little while for the slot. And it says my waiting time's less than one minute. So I'm going to pause this. I'm waiting for Nopix to uh, get ready. And uh, open VNC viewer if no window has opened. Ah, right. Okay. Allow pop-ups. I don't even need to minimize it. Right, let's see what's happening. Nopix is booting. I don't know how I missed this. I really don't. Uh, I think it's been around for a few months now. Um, and I, I'm sure I heard it mentioned at some point. And I did intend to have a look. But it's just one of those things that faded into the background. And uh, I never actually got chance. Uh, speaking of fading into the background, well, it's obviously working, or it's doing something. Let's just uh, wait and see if... Oh, right, okay. So here we have Nopix 8.6. In a VNC viewer, LXDE, Wine pre-installed, System Tools, Sound and Video. Whoa! Has it got internet? Let's just find out. I wouldn't imagine it's going to be very fast because it's working on VNC over a network. But uh, the fact, well, there we go. The fact that you can actually have a look at a system. Let's try Google. See if it'll go to that. No internet. Okay. Right. Why is there no internet? Let's have a look. Okay. There is no internet, apparently. I don't know whether that's by design. Uh, I would imagine that's not a bad thing if that's the case. But, uh, or it might just be that my internet hasn't actually come on yet. But, hey-ho. Not a problem. Edit connections, enable networking. Okay. <laughs> Too much to hope for. But to be honest, you, you wouldn't use something like this as a, a system you would actually use uh, in anger, so to speak. It's something you'd use just to have a quick look and uh, to see what it looks like. And, uh, wow. Nopix has been around for years, many years ago when I was an IT tech, uh, going out and fixing people's computer computers. Nopix was one of the tools that you always used to take with you uh, so that you could uh, fire it up and have a look at the hard drive of people's broken Windows computers, generally speaking. Okay, enough of that though. Let's shut that down. Log out. And, yeah, I'm just going to shut that down. I'm absolutely amazed that this is actually uh, working in a web browser. They must have such a huge server. I don't want to reconnect. I want to cancel. No VNC. Okay, that's great. That's fine. Uh, system stop. Okay. Brilliant. I'm going to have a play with that and uh, have a look at some other distros. That should probably be it for today's uh, bank holiday ramble. Um, I know it's been very unstructured, but I said that's what I was going to do. And I, I had a few ideas that I wanted to go through. Um, I may well keep this as a... Um, a regular thing. I, I can't say it'll always be on a Sunday, but 
Um, if I have something to say and something I'd like to chat about, why not? Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a little bit different. It's not meant to be a tutorial. It's just a bit of a natter with you. Uh, some of the things that are going through my head. Um, a little bit of entertainment, so to speak. Um, doesn't necessarily have to uh, fulfill any particular function other than a bit of a chat. Anyway, guys, uh, enjoy what's left of the weekend. I know the temperature is soaring here. It's getting a little bit hot, actually. Um, but uh, you can always guarantee in Lancashire that's going to be a temporary thing. That's it for now. See you later in the week. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please like and subscribe. It really helps. And stay well until next time.